Welcome everyone to Shack Conversations Bay Area Art and Equity, sponsored by Shack 15, Oakland Art Murmur, and Immersive Arts Alliance. My name is Michelle Antoinette Nelson. I am the moderator for this conversation about Afrofuturism. And we have some amazing artists joining us today. We have uh, Shogun Shido. Shogun is a 28-year-old self-taught artist raised in New Orleans, now based in Oakland, California. Shogun uses art to invoke healing through creative expression and prompt awareness to, to his ancestral roots through storytelling. Up next, we have Ashara Ekundayo. Ashara is a Black feminist independent curator, cultural theologian, artist, creative industries, entrepreneur, and organizer working internationally across sectors through her company, AE Creative Consulting Partners. Her philanthropic platform, Artists as First Responders, serves as a portal for her recent initiatives, Blatant Zine Forum, the, Reflect the Reflection Fund for Artists, and Black Space Residency, all of which provide containers for imagination, inquiry, activity, and rest. And last but certainly not least, we have Awan Mance. Awan is a professor of English and Ethnic Studies at Mills College and a lifelong artist and writer. Her art and comics have appeared in shows, festivals, and publications from the Bay Area to Brooklyn. Welcome everyone. So glad to have you. Oh, come on in the room. Yeah. Hey. yeah. Thank you. So glad to have you. Reading reading your bios and uh, looking at your Instagram pages and your social media and, and just seeing your work and knowing the time that it takes and knowing the uh, just just the process and and I know that the the rain is this this conversation it ranges how many years have people have been doing things and and all of that and I love that uh, in this conversation we have people just representing each facet of of how this how the continuum of art can go. So we're going to open up with the first question, which is going to go to Awan. Uh, what is your definition? Right. Of, are you ready? No, I'm ready. All right. <laughs> what is your definition of Afrofuturism as a concept? And what first piqued your interest about Afrofuturism as you see it? Well, um, for me, Afrofuturism is, the definition is fairly simple. Um, it's uh, the idea of imagining a future in which Blackness is an integral part. Um, I would go beyond that and say that it's actually imagining its future, its art, music, any form, any art form that centers Blackness and imagines us in the future. Um, and I do want to also clarify that um, particularly the uh, novelist Nnedi Okorafor identifies a um, African futurism as where her work falls, um, not just centering Blackness in her work, but she always wants to make that distinction to say that she centers Africanness, the African continent and African identities in her work. So there's Afrofuturism and African futurism, um, but there are a lot of intersections there. And so for me, that's what Afrofuturism really is all about, giving ourselves permission to look into the future and a future that doesn't just include us, but that centers us. Mm. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's interesting. It, can you give just a, a, a little bit into the difference uh, between Afrofuturism and African futurism? Is it in yeah. it, where it, it originated or... Um, well, I will say, I, um, from what I understand, um, Nnedi Okorafor created the term African Futurism oh, okay. um, because of the work that she does, which is very much about, and I think I'd say her novel Binti, to me, is a paradigmatic example that takes an African tribe that is a, an, a very old tribe, an ancient tribe, and then imagines that tribe several hundred years in the future, and what's critically important in African futurism is that several hundred years in the future, the Himba are still Himba. 
And so those practices that distinguish this particular tribe using red clay on the skin and throughout the hair, 300 years ahead, futurist, futurism and technological advancement and mathematical prodigiousness, because this is a tribe of mathematical prodigies that she imagines, does not mean the Himba do not still engage in practices that when Europeans saw them, they called primitive. And so it's also disrupting notions of the primitive and the advanced so that we see that culture shouldn't be, shouldn't have a label and has nothing to do with one's capacity to advance. Wow. That's powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So what got everyone interested in Afrofuturism? How do you relate to the future? And what did things, what things did you imagine growing up? We're going to start this with Ashara. Hmm. Well, first of all, I'm really happy to be here in a conversation with you all. And I just want to, I want to give a, a land acknowledgement uh, from the place that I'm sitting, you know, holding this conversation uh, in the unceded land of the Ohlone people, uh, Ramatush and um, Chechenyo people here in uh, the Bay Area in San Francisco and Oakland. And so I want to honor you know, their work and their stewarding of the land. And it is from this place right here that I'm able to um, engage in my, my artistic practice, my curatorial practice. So I just want to honor the land and the people who have stewarded that land um, here and who are still here. And so, you know, when I think about the land, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. I grew up in a, in a city that was and continues to be 85% or more Black. So Black culture was the norm. It was what I experienced. Um, it's embodied for me. And so when I think about growing up uh, in the era off the heels of the Black power movement at that time, it was really music. It was music that was kind of like my first, I think, understanding before they were using the word Afrofuturism of what it meant to know that Black people would survive and be part of the future of, of the future period, regardless of what I saw on TV. Um, I had I had Patti LaBelle, I had LaBelle, you know what I mean? I had Grace Jones, I had Parliament Funkadelic. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I grew up with DJs who played everything. And so, you know, that whole kind of like gamut of sound from Africa Bambada to like craft work through the electrifying Mojo, who's a DJ who came on every night at 10 o'clock and just schooled us. And I mean, schooled us in a way in which we could call the radio station and he would put us all on hold and he would talk to us. Like he would literally like, this is who this is. This is who I'm playing. This is where they're from. So hearing music from Appalachia and Japan and Motown down the street, that was normal. And so for me, it was like, it was the music industry and the, and the, and the music that like, had me knowing, had me knowing that, you know, black people, black people, we gonna survive because we've been doing this. Wow. You know, we've been doing this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so funny when you mentioned LaBelle, all I could, all I can remember is the hair. And yeah, and I used to wonder like, is that her hair? What is, how did she make that happen? Uh, they, they're just, oh, so they were so ahead of their time. And yet, Wait, so right you know Hendrix. Yeah, I mean, Nona Hendrix, I mean, the whole kind of outfit, the whole ensemble yeah. was, you know, and people, we, so people see Patti LaBelle now and they're like, oh, that's Patti LaBelle who makes the Patti Pies. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Let me, y'all need to go and Google some LaBelle <laughs> and see how amazing and how forward thinking and fashion forward and just mind blowing, you know, she was and they were. And like I said, that was Nona Hendrix. That was, you know, who was part of LaBelle. Yes. You yes. know what I mean? And then you yes. have Grace Jones. Great. I have like my life before meeting Grace Jones, my life after Grace Jones. She's still an integral part of my ideas around being a black woman on this planet and what that means to be a bad ass artist. Grace. Grace. Mm. Grace. That's all. <laughs> Shogun. <laughs> Shogun. Yeah, uh, what interests you in Afrofuturism and how do you relate it to the future? Mm, first and foremost, I want to give like my love 
and uh, just appreciation for all of you. Um, happy International Women's Month. You know, this, like I said, is the cornerstone uh, of my existence, you know, coming from a woman, especially a black woman, uh, which I believe is the God. And all we can go on that, you know, all day. <laughs> but uh just want to show my appreciation to you. Mm. Um working through my nerves. This is my first time doing something like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you got it right. You got it right. There you go. <laughs> uh as far as uh, Afrofuturism and how I got involved with it, um coming from the south, uh I grew up in a little town outside of New Orleans called Destrehan, Louisiana. I'm not sure if many people are familiar with it, but it's kind of like a like a highway town. There's only like one way in, one way out, like no transit system. So like as a kid, um, uh, my my reality was kind of like limited. So my imagination had to be stimulated through cartoons and like comic books and music. So uh, essentially my idea of the future, especially in the black experience uh, came from watching music videos on 106 and Park and stuff and like uh, watching Outkast and like Ludacris with these like wild, like uh, outrageous video, just like really, uh, I don't know, just imaginative. imaginative. Uh, and the cartoons was like watching Static Shock or uh, seeing, seeing a black superhero in the Justice League when all the Justice Leaguers are like white, you know, so to be like, oh, yo, like this is something of a, of a tangible future. Like I could be something more than what uh, people are telling me or what is put in front of me as far as like, yo, this is the limit of your existence. You know, that really boosted me into thinking uh, even even beyond, you know, like believing that I could be an astronaut and I could go to the other world, you know, and bring my people mm -hmm. and cultivate life for all the worlds of my people. Um, and, and even getting older and, uh, you know, digging to my history to, to know that we, we are these like powerful beings, like we're, we're kings, we're queens, we're, we're these ethereal beings that have these, this, this power to achieve that, you know, to be resilient, you know, and to have that ingrained in my DNA. And, uh, that essentially what got me into like the, the, that was my first flavor of uh, Afrofuturism. And then also just like the music of New Orleans. Like if you walk in the streets of mm -hmm. New Orleans and and don't hear music, there might be something wrong. You know, mm -hmm. like you don't mm -hmm. see uh, uh, a group of group of black children on the corner playing brass instruments, you know, or, or the Mardi Gras Indians, you know, walking on doing Mardi Gras with just like their auras and everything like that. Like, yeah, that's 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 what really got me all into it. Yeah, I was thinking about that when I saw that you were from New Orleans. You know, I, I when I first went to New Orleans for the first time, I felt like I was I'm from Baltimore and I felt like I had walked through the looking glass mm -hmm. and I was in this magical place that had all of this energy and excitement and ability to even like the laws allow for artists to just create in such a way and to extend their time and be in. And I was amazed. I went home and I was like, if only we could get the laws different so that we can mm. exist, you know? Um, and so when I saw you were from New Orleans, I was like, oh my gosh, like he's going to be a powder keg of like this culture. Right. So. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's definitely like a, it's a melting, it's a gumbo pot mm -hmm. of of culture and and flavor and just and just expression. Like I, there wasn't a day that would go by that I wasn't inspired by my city um, and by somebody I would see out and just expressing themselves, whether that be visually, uh, acoustically, um, or just like generally just being out there, just doing something creative. Uh, to get by or just the, to to make it through, you know, the day to day. So yeah. that's endless inspiration. Wow. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. And Awan, uh, <laughs> how did you get interested in Afrofuturism and what uh, things did you imagine growing up? 
I'm I'm from the East Coast, grew up on Long Island, um, spent a lot of time in the South because my entire family is from the South. Um, but, you know, my, you know, spent a lot of time at the American Museum of Natural History, kind of immersed in science. My dad had all his science books from college, including one that was specifically imagining what the future would be like, what was going to happen to the earth and would it be enveloped by the sun, would it break into two? And I must have read those books you know, especially that one over and over again as a kid. And so it just got me into the mindset of thinking about the future. And, you know, you know as, as a kid in the 70s, um, I don't, I noticed what wasn't included in sci-fi, but I found my permission to imagine a Black future with, in my family. Um, and, you know, when you know really, really old Black people, then you are the future. And so it gives you this permission to imagine 100 years in the future. Um, but also, you know, the era of Nichelle Nichols on Star Trek. And, um, you know, as we begin to see, you know, which was just remarkable. And, um, you know, by the time I was in graduate school, you know, LeVar Burton with Lieutenant yeah. Commander Jordy on Next Generation. Yeah. And so this visibility, I got acquainted with these figures, people in film, Yafet Koto in the original movie Alien, all of these folks who are having these adventures. Um, before I read my first Afrofuturist novel, which happened you know, late in life, 1995, when I read um, my first Octavia Butler novel. And, um, and then that just was transformative um, in, and then when I heard the first heard the term Afrofuturism, I I knew that that was for me, because I had watched all of Cosmos, the original series, <laughs> back you know, and taken notes. I love the idea of imagining what would happen on that great adventure when you go into the you take a you know a spaceship into the future, and you're going so fast that your present is the future of the people you left behind. And so when I started reading. Octavia Butler and then Samuel Delaney and then you see all these other writers. I was I was there for it for real. Wow. Yes. I love that. And I'm so glad you brought up Star Trek and um and the fact that uh black people were not in sci-fi. Black people were not planted in the future. And that didn't start happening until uh that the the era that uh, Shogun is actually talking about, you know, like when he was growing up, it didn't that did not that was not really a thing. And just a fun fact: anybody who's a Trekkie, there are two actors on Next Generation who existed in the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. Can anybody tell me who they were? And they're black. Can anybody tell me? Maybe a one. Gaiden, Whoopi Goldberg, and Lavar Burton. They exist in the past, the present, and the future. Color Purple, Roots, any movie they were doing presently or reading Rainbow, and then Star Trek. So you have won the this round, Ashara. You got it. I'm a total, I'm a total Trekkie, first of yes. all. And, you know, I grew up watching Star Trek and Sesame Street, which is also another futuristic yes. uh, the creative process that was offered, you know, to, to children. And so much of like, I, I could be anything, you know, because the Muppets could be anything. And they presented so many different ideas and ways of like showing up in your community and your neighborhood and how to be human, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah, that whole kind of like Spock, Spock was my dude. So Spock and then Ernie, I was like, yeah, these are, these are my, these are my beings, you know? You know, yeah, I don't know. There, there didn't, there wasn't ever a time where I didn't think that black people would be in the future. It didn't. Right. That was not the reality that I was presented. You know, as a child, as a young person growing up, and it has a lot to do with. I grew up in a black city, with mm -hmm. black brilliance and black excellence being modeled every day. So, you know. I just, you know, just shout out to folks who get to, who got the opportunity to be immersed in black culture and, and knew that their grandmother was the goddess already. You know what I mean? And that if you are lucky, you get to have that same kind of admiration tossed upon you that we gave to our, our, our grandparents and, and our ancestors and through that reverence. So it, for me, that idea that black people weren't in the future, that was never 
part of my reality. Wow. Yeah. That's what, you know, well put, well put. Um, that actually leads us into our next question, which I'm going to uh, aim at Shogun. Uh, do you see Afrofuturism in art as a political statement? As a political statement, uh, I mean, when it comes to when it comes to defining a point or or to realizing the reality that we want, um, I wouldn't say it's political aside from the people who would see it as a threat to their existence. But ultimately, amongst like black folk, I wouldn't see it to be political. I would see it bringing a bringing awareness to self uh, and and just introducing ideas of reimagining their, their, their current reality and how the future could be shaped. Um, and just giving options of like, of life, you know, just giving different perspectives that aren't necessarily uh, promoted on a lot of uh, propaganda or like spaces that we're uh, uh, quote unquote allowed to to roam in, you know, uh, where it's curated for us to to think a certain way or to have that limitations on our minds, you know, uh, like the sister was saying, uh, it's a blessing to be uh, immersed in black culture, uh, and sometimes some black people don't don't have that, you know, that uh, that opportunity to get the full immersedness to be able to even have the imagination to think in in that realm. Uh, so for art to be a part of it, like, like I wouldn't say it's uh, necessarily political, uh, like I said, unless other folks see it as a, a threat to their own personal existence. Hmm. In very, very interesting perspective. Anyone else want to jump on that before we go to the next question? Yeah, sure. I am. Um, you know, I definitely think that, um, you know, it's it's for me. It would be political in as much as black black people giving black joy is political. Mm. Um, it's a flashpoint um, in a white supremacist society that depends on black silence and subjugation. So when black people, you know, black future imagines not just black people living but thriving and growing into the future, and so that in some ways is an inherent threat to white supremacy and also the joy that black people take in those imaginings. Um, you know, when I, I uh, when it's a non-pandemic year, I'm at Comic-Con San Diego in July. And when I see black people cosplaying, I think this is the permission to play and to not grieve and to not, you know, as Zora Neale Hurston called it, to not be tragically colored, but to have a good time and imagine and indulge. And that, when we're doing it, it actually feels like what we ought to be doing. But for those who are unaccustomed to seeing Black people giving themselves permission to do these things, it is political to the watcher, to the viewer. And some people, depending on their positionality, depending on whether or not they have come to terms with um, white supremacy and not wanting to perpetuate it, will take great joy in seeing Black people inhabit that space. But for some people, that will not be okay. And for me, that makes the, the geeking out all the sweeter, really. <laughs> yes, the geeking out. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, let's see here. The next question is for Ashara. So imagining and building a conceptual future is an obvious piece of Afrofuturism, but how does the past influence and transform Afrofuturist narratives for you in your work? Mm, well, um, my understanding of our reality, you know, how spirits move and how humans move on this planet and our relationship to all things above, uh, I know that we live on a timeline. You know, there's a trajectory of the past the now and the future. If you believe in the past and the future, uh, I'm an Afro Nowist. And so there is very much though, the construct of Sankofa that says, go back and fetch it, right? Go back and get it. Uh, so that you have this information and this, this knowing that our ancestors left us a roadmap. They left us recipes. Um, 
they they left us messages, you know, on how to engage and how to talk to and how to take in uh, the medicine of this planet, you know. So, I mean, for me, I mean, my spiritual practices as well, you know, tell me that there is uh, an ancestral realm that we can communicate uh, with those who are gone before us and those who are coming, you know. So this idea of being a spiritual, a spiritual person who uses my spiritual practices as well in my beliefs, uh, in my art practice, you know, this idea of of, of Afrofuturism um, shows up for me through, you know, visual artists, movement artists, poet writers, um, musicians, and DJs. And um, there's uh, my older son, my firstborn son, is a a pretty amazing teacher, uh, master grower, farmer, vegan chef, all of those things. And I didn't teach him those things. He taught me those things. So he channeled that information through the ancestral portal. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I didn't teach him how to grow food. He taught me how to grow food. Wow. So when I, yeah. So when I think about, um, you know, what does that mean to like be inside of this, this idea of the past? And the future is that I'm looking at it in a generational conversation uh, with uh, DJ Kavum, Itaf Bita, and you know him being my first muse, honestly, uh, and continuing to be my teacher. But you know, still, I'm still the mama. But you know, I'm I'm really aware of his Afrofuturist perspective and the way in which he talks about uh, the redefinition of wealth and health. And um, the way in which, you know, as an example, he plays music for his crops, you know, when he's growing sunflowers and beans and squash and corn, he actually puts his music in the middle of the patch and plays music for, for the food. I have a video. I'd love to show it to you. You sit down, smudging all four directions. The lessons from the gods, actions manifest blessings. Thank you for the altar, never hesitating. Or we got that water, growing like the nation. Live on that Tucson, black like the magic. We birthed the alchemy, black like Sabbath. Bobo Shanti, Baba Lao, Imhotep. Golden child, soul southern now. When I step the black samurai, with the mantras from the town. My eye, get the money. I'm showing with the style. My shit got like a warrior. Yeah, check huh. Afro not funk is the high stepper. Telescopes for the sun, moon, and stars in them. On the road to Sasha money with the mob again. It's the hip hop who do wake the dumb from the grave. And Zinga, supreme leader, the first teacher, the sage. Praying all for directions. Sage better blaze, clarify your intention. Still a side and dive in. Take a look in my jungle book. Jump out with bundles of roots that rumble, run on McDonald's troops. Tarzan, black man from the bush they took. We still carry medicine. Oshun, beekeeper, be tweety boga. Blow tobacco over the crown and shoulders. Sweet cedar, activate your mesa. Healing hearts with Hashuma from Ubanda to Santaria. Puff and motor with Maria Sabina, Eden and Rita. In the rain, chopping ayahuasca. We're chopping it up with copper, unk, wild and rasta. From the future, fill the slums with chlorophyll like supernova. Grinning at the Grim Reaper, the Icaros make the potion seep deeper. Hood healers, pure fire. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, go back and fetch it. <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> yes. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I'm still feeling that sound in my chest. So maybe just take I need a that moment. Name one more time. Listen. Yeah, it's, it's, called, it's called Breath of the Shaman. So that was uh, Itaf Vita with uh, Seasons, Ashel Seasons, who is a dope MC living in the Bay Area. Living in, yeah, who we were all green for all fellows back in the day. So, you know, doing green jobs, uh, <laughs> environmental justice work back in the day with this cat named Van Jones. You might have heard of him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were we were all Van Jones uh, Green for All fellows back in the day with several other several other wow. Bay Area artists who we know and love uh, like Jen Johns and um, I mean literally <laughs> a lot of a lot of other artists who were uh, Sophia Harris uh, also Green for All fellow Pandora Thomas yeah mm -hmm. wow mm -hmm. well thank you again for sharing that and. It fits so perfectly into this conversation. Uh, wow. So, so Awan, who and or what, uh, uh, what's an unconventional Afro Afrofuturist artist or genre that you admire? I think you touched on this a little bit, but. Yeah. Um, you know, I, um, you know, I'll I'll keep it succinct, but I will say there are two um, Afrofuturist um, directions that I, I that I'm interested in. One is I would say um, looking to the past, uh, because Afrofuturism is now. But Afro, when we think about what Afrofuturism is, it really began in some ways in the 19th century with Black people imagining a different future and using it to look at what freedom would look like. So mm -hmm. you know, sudden E. Griggs, Imperio in Imperio. Imperium and Imperio, you know, imagining a black revolution and what that would look like. Um, two friends experiencing this and deciding who's going to be going the more conformist way and who's going to just be the upstart and turn things over. Um, I think about someone like W.E.B. Du Bois' The Comet, which was one of the first kind of sci-fi pieces of the 20th century and still holds up very well right now. Um, but there's also a black sister from uh, um, Ohio named uh, um, Gertrude Dorsey Brown, who wrote a story called A Case of Measure for Measure, in which she imagines what happens if someone gets so good at doing blackface for white people that they can't get it off. And they have to actually experience what it's like to live in Jim Crow segregation. I mean, this woman was writing this in 19, I think it was 1906 that she published this story. Can you say that premise again? Oh yeah, um, uh, an African American woman who works in the kitchen at a white person's house comes up with this. She uses it to keep her skin looking beautiful, but it turns out that the white people who she works for realize if they put it on as blackface, they look really authentic to go to their what they called the Negro Ball events, where they all pretend to be black people, which apparently was a thing for wealthy white people at the turn of the last century. But they put it on and they can't get it off. And so when they have to go home to the different parts of the country they're coming from to go to this big event, they have to sit in the Jim Crow car because no one believes they're white because the product she creates is so amazing. So this black woman who is completely uneducated, she doesn't have traditional education, but she has folk knowledge and she has, you know, knowledge passed down to her from the ancestors and she creates this scientifically amazing product that effectively turns black people, I mean, turns white people into black people. And they finally get it around segregation and racism. And this is just a regular black woman from a middle-class black woman from Ohio who wrote this story. Um, and it's called A Case of Measure for Measure in 1906. And I'm working on an, a version, it's a novella, putting it back into print, but it's it's deep. And so these, that is some of my favorite Afrofuturism with these black folks at a time when we don't even think of black people imagining and they're doing it and they're doing, you know, um, Charles Chestnut and his whole Conjure Woman series, a black magical woman who's free and black people go to her and white people go to her and she has this ultimate power. Um, and I love that that also is this power that comes from being the the Afro diasporic tradition of conjuring, so that that old school black speculative um, and futuristic fiction is unexpected. 
it's way out there because they're not in a genre. It's not a genre at the time. And they just give themselves to permission to do all kinds of stuff. And that is wonderful to me. Um, it, it, go ahead. I didn't mean oh, to catch no, you up. I, I, I'm just like, my mind is racing because now I, I absolutely need to go and get into a case of Measure for Measure. I've got to see this for myself. And I start to think about, um, as you're talking, I'm making parallels in my head between what you're saying and something like Lovecraft Country, yeah. um, and, you know, and and or Get Out, you know, like mm -hmm. when you're talking about the 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 getting stuck as a, a black person or and or on purpose getting put in a black person. Like I'm I'm just thinking of 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 those works as you're describing them. And I'm wondering, I've got so many questions now. <laughs> like is Jordan Peele like in all of that? It's like or is this or 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 is he channeling and he doesn't even know it? Like you know you know like so so many questions and and wow thank you. I I feel smarter because of <laughs> thank you. It's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I totally took a note on that too, Dr. Nate, Dr. Mance. I took a note on that. I said, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I again, Michelle, like you, I went into Lovecraft Country and it was at episode three. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm still messed up. I'm still messed up around watching her drop off that the, yeah. white skin back. I, I, I was just undone, continue to be undone by the brilliance of the writing of that show. You're talking about Afrofuturism. I was like, yeah. well. I still, okay. don't, I still don't fully know what I watched and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And every week, my wife and I did not know what we were watching and we watched it because we had to. There was something in it that we needed, you know, and, and hopefully it, they'll do an, another season or they'll keep, you know, keep it going. Uh, but it is important. That kind of of you can't even describe it to people. You just you have can't. to say it's, like, yeah. it's a it's an absolute rupture in the yeah. whole conversation. It's just it's such a, a departure from what we are accustomed to seeing as I think some of these so-called Afrofuturist uh, musings in mm -hmm. mainstream media or just in the conversation, mm -hmm. but for something that is very mainstream, it was disturbing in the way in which you want to be disturbed. Mm -hmm. Like disrupt me, shake me, mm -hmm. you know, get get me out of my what I think is Afrofuturism to like, no, how about this shit? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. You ain't seen nothing yet. We ain't seen nothing yet. We got something for you. <laughs> well, we got, we just have a few more questions and then we're gonna wrap it up. So I, I just want to say thank you guys for uh, being a part of this conversation and I mean, truly feeding my spirit and my soul today. And I know anyone and everyone that consumes this and watches this and gets involved with this is going to feel shifted and changed and healed in some way. So let's get into the, the last, the final questions. Um, this one is for Shogun. What mediums do you see promoting Afrofuturist art the most? Which, which one do I see? Uh, I could see like installation, installation art or like visual art or performative <laughs> art. Um, that's really kind of been my focus lately is more so how can, uh, how can you build that world in the physical realm? Uh, and have and have uh, black folks come into that world to give them that immediate perspective of like okay like not only am I imagining it you know but now I see it right here in front of me this is something I could it stimulates all the senses essentially um, something that you could taste you could touch you could smell you could you could really be immersed in that experience more so so that you could carry that experience with you. Uh, and pass it on to other people. Like, yes, I have experienced this, this, this glimpse of the future of this possible future, um, and and now I can I can now carry this with me and have even more power and drive uh, to make it a reality in my own world. 
Right. And and where do you see those things coming forth? Where do you see them? Like, like we just talked about Netflix. You know, we just talked about like TV, but like, where do you consume it the most? Like, is it TV, podcast, social media? I, but it sounded like to me you were talking about exhibitions. Yeah, it's like a mix of exhibitions and social media. So mm -hmm. social media for me right now is like the main platform. Uh, it's like the it's replaced the news network. It's like where everybody mm -hmm. can to get their flood of information and where you could, it's like a, a crossing point of, of so many different perspectives and ideas that could go into like one jar uh, that people can like open up and like take out and see it out, lay it out in front of them. So I definitely have to say social media uh, and like TV networks, but also exhibitions as well. Okay. And do you see any places where you feel like you'd like to see it more? Mm, definitely more conversations about it. Um, and I mean, like my thing is trying to find a way to bring it in more into the communities and how you can make it uh, a tangible, a tangible way that you can introduce it to communities of people who might not have access to those ideals or those concepts. So uh, I don't know what category that falls under, um but more so just like as as personal as it could get you know uh because i don't like relying too much on the digital age mm -hmm. uh, but like that has caused a detachment from a lot of a lot of the reality um so it's like two some things could get too tethered in imagination and it needs to have that balance of both reality and uh and that imagination so mm -hmm. yes and i guess grounded in community what do you think about that, Ashara? Uh, you do a lot of community work, and uh, you do have that Black Space Residency, um, which you which it says here provides containers for imagination, inquiry, activity, and practice. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and Tuna says it's incredible. So, so how does that? How does what he says feed into that work? I mean, I, I have some thoughts. You know, the question for me, I think the first thought I had, of course, are like the visor. You know, I thought about augmented reality and, you know, virtual reality at first. Um, but, you know, what brother was saying in terms of like, how do you get this message, this information out to the folks who wouldn't normally have access to the conversation? I'm, I'm always interested in what are, how to create low barriers to entry into the conversation, even into the so-called art world or the art sector. Um, and, and creating spaces where the not usual suspects would feel welcome to come, feel like they could belong to come there. Mm -hmm. um, I remember maybe at this point four years ago, maybe it's even five years ago, there's um, a collective called Hyphen Labs that created a, an AR project called Neurospeculative Afrofeminism. Mm -hmm. And yeah, get your mind blown, get your life. <laughs> speculative Afrofeminism. It actually premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and uh, it, it tour, they toured it all over, but it's, a, it's an AR, VR, it's a VR art installation where you put on the headset and you are able to sit down in a um, hair salon, black girls sit down and get your hair done. And when you put on the headset, you are taken into this space, this other world, which for me looks like the world of Octavia E. Butler. <laughs> and so you enter into like this realm and you, and information from your ancestors is imparted to you through the apparatus put upon your hair to get your hair done. So, yeah, so th these, are, these are black and brown uh, women, queer folks who co-founded this, this collective. And you know they're they're neuro they're neuroscientists, so you know, I'm thinking about like and and I had the the opportunity to to share that exhibition to have people come to my art gallery, which was in um, downtown for two years. Uh, Ashara Ekundayo Gallery was downtown, and we, you know, we had that exhibition as part of a, a group show, and. Everybody, like I remember that first Friday, there being kind of like this line out the door with all of these children who had never put on a headset. Mm -hmm. Just it's just something you see, right? You see all of these images, and with with you know you see like cool you know black people with afros and headsets, but they never put on one. Mm -hmm. 
It's like put on the headset and sit down in this chair and watch this piece of art that was created and designed by a black woman. So I think I'm thinking about that. And I'm also, so what are the low barriers? How do we create containers for that? And then um, the other piece for me that I think is interesting that's happening right now is a conversation around NFTs in the art world. You better get out of my brain. <laughs> Like this whole, and so, you know, when you were talking, um, brother, about like social media, it's like me kind of like getting a lesson through Clubhouse. Like, I'm like, literally, well, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> like, what is happening? this whole non fungible token um, artwork? And then uh, my, my comrade, Lady Phoenix, who is like just a phenomenal uh, digital artist, like thought leader, like international thought leader living here in, in the Bay Area, who is kind of the guru of this, like brought NFTs and the art world into Clubhouse. So there's like mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of people who are like having this conversation of what it means to like um, sell a piece of digital art. Sometimes you also get the physical piece of art but that it allows artists to actually um, continue to get royalties from the sale of their art. You know yes. what I mean? So yes. I actually minted my first piece of art. Like I just, I just grabbed a photo and just literally this conversation is happening through Clubhouse. I'm like, you know, you can't DM anybody on Clubhouse. So I like go to their Instagram, sent them a DM on Instagram. Um, they emailed me back and said, okay, I can teach you and three other people about NFTs. And we did it. Like it literally happened off, you know, it's like, now call me and we're going to have a regular Zoom call and I'm going to walk you through this platform. I'm going to yeah. walk you through. So it, it, that's what I needed. Talk to me like I'm a fourth grader and I'm like, wait, what are NFTs and why is this so important right now in the art world? And what does it mean for Black people in terms of being in the future and being able to be um, financially stable from making royalty, getting royalties from the work that you created, whether it be in the blockchain or in the physical world. You, I am so glad you brought that up because this whole time I've been ruminating on if I wanted to even bring up the NFTs because it's <laughs> such an expansive conversation, but it's yeah. so important to this conversation to even to, to, to know that it exists so for 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 people who don't quite know what this is, it's directly related to cryptocurrency and the evolution of these ecosystems that uh, are being created around these tokens. And so mm -hmm. there are decentralized platforms that are like eBay, but are in the crypto world. So there's a place called app.rarable um, that you can make an account and do what Ashara has done. And you can make an account and mint your first piece and it becomes this coin, this non-fungible token that people can either bid on like eBay or you can set your actual price like buy now and mm -hmm. people can buy it. They can say it's one of five, one of 10 or it's an original piece. And then you set your pricing based on, and this particular one is uh, Ethereum that they use. And you set your price and it gives you, it's very simple. They tell you what it equates to in US dollars. And you can also say, I want 5% on, on this piece. If somebody uses it, some, if this person who buys it uses it somewhere else. And that's what Ashara is talking about when it comes to the royalty. So that's in that's it in a very small nutshell. But um, mm -hmm. I have literally been in this rabbit hole for two weeks. So I'm so glad you brought it up so I could like share what I know. It's a and you were able to break that down. It is a rabbit hole. <laughs> It is, it is. I, I, had, I, had, I had to like like sit with it because you know it's so completely out of the realm of what we know which is very like linear and this is how you create this is how you sell it this is what you do and i literally had to tap into the fact that i am a sci-fi junkie and i love the idea of this and basically all the things cryptocurrency and all of that stuff is basically being outside of the matrix learning how to read the ones and zeros so so that's it. That's, that's it. That's, that's like it. Now. Life in the blockchain. Life in the blockchain. You know what in I'm the saying? blockchain. You're literally reading the, the the ones and the zeros. You you are the on the outside. So, like, thank you for bringing that up. Um, anybody else? Uh, I saw I saw Shogun. You know a little bit about it. Have you done it? Because your work is your work is tokens. 
Yeah, yeah your like, work is definitely token. I've been deep in the in the blockchain uh, YouTube rabbit hole. Uh, a couple people told me about it, and uh, like most importantly, it's me getting that understanding before uh, that structure is kind of built around it to kind of shadow ban black artists or kind of like undermine. So I'm trying to like mm. develop the knowledge on that tip of being able to make uh, or find people to make our own separate pl platform like while it's still you know gaining a lot of that traction you know so just basing that mm -hmm. understanding so i know how to do it and doing it correctly but i, I trust and believe i'm <laughs> i'm right there <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting and you know it's a huge huge debate around it around you know people being able to do stuff like i just heard uh wu-tang took some a, a guy's art a piece of art and um altered it a little bit did something with it made it like a gift and then sold it as a token so that i just saw that on twitter yesterday mm -hmm. And so there's a lot to it. So, you know, there's not a lot of regulation. So everything about it is risky, but it also could be really phenomenal when you're taking out the middleman and being able to, to get your own, your money straight up, right? So uh, I'm gonna, because I can, we could do this for a while. I'm gonna go to the next one. <laughs> it's a whole other conversation, yeah. yeah. Black art, it's black art. It's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. it's a whole you yeah. said well, that, that, there you go, Ashara. Let's talk about it because that can be a thing we talk about. Next um, <laughs> you said what? Next episode. <laughs> Next episode. Next episode. Uh, uh, okay, so we're gonna. This is for everyone. I'm gonna start with Awan though, and this is actually our last question. So I'm gonna start with Awan. Using your artist mind, if you yeah. could choose one of the five senses to grow stronger in the future, which would it be and why? Oh, wow. Well, I think um, as a visual artist, I would have to say sight. Um, and, um, you know, if I could grow it stronger, see farther, more clearly, I'd love to be able to see far, so far that I can see into the future, but also have some sort of enhanced insight into the past. Uh, that would be amazing if sight could evolve, perhaps using artificial intelligence, who knows, um, some sort of nanotechnologies that would enable us to see so far into the, so far um, geographically that it actually was the future. Um, and then to give us some way of kind of taking in the energy of the past so that we could actually see the shadows of those who've gone before and maybe take in some of their knowledge and some of their energy. I would love to, that I would love to see. I think that would be amazing. Wow. Oh, Shogun, what about you? Uh, that was incredible. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, it absolutely was. Like, I kind of wanted to take a moment of silence and just yeah, sit. <laughs> um, I also was thinking about how I'm scared to get LASIK. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that, that, that frightened me but it was also beautiful it was be really awesome you know what I'm saying <laughs> um, mm, you said the five senses or, this, or is this the six can I use the sixth sense please artist talk yeah. to me about the sixth sense uh, just like intuition just like if I can oh. even deeper uh, all I ever wish for is to be as as closely collect, connected to my ancestors as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, if that link could just be strengthened through my intuition, then that's I could I could be that vessel even more so than I already am. You know, like I I know things, but there's a lot that I don't know. Y'all have been putting me on game this whole time. Uh, I definitely need to go back and hit the books. Like, you know, I'm, like, I'm not properly prepared right now. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, essentially just uh, tapping more into that intuition, having a stronger link with my ancestors that have gone, the ancestors that are here with me now, and those that are being birthed, the seeds that will be sowed into the future. Oh, I say. Ashe, thank you for that. Ashara, you want me to read it again or you got it? I, I'm here for that sixth sense vibe. You know, I, I really, I love that. But I'm still waiting on my Google Glass. So I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like, look. I got, 
it's, it's, you know what's wrong? I got messed up because I actually got to put them on for about 30 minutes one time years ago. And I'm like, I don't understand why we don't have, all have this. Why don't, why don't I have this? Like, I need this. So for those of, those of you who want to say, what, what is Google Glass? Again, please Google it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, why don't we all have our Google Glass? I think if I had to pick a, a, you know, that's really a hard one. The sixth sense is the sense of intuition. And that is is definitely where um, the, the question lands for me. But I'm also, I'm thinking about the sense of touch. Mm. You know, the sense of touch as I've been, um, you know, like so many of us, like only being touched by one person for the last year, mm. you know, and... Uh, what it what it might feel like to be able to hug my friends again, what it might feel like to be able to put my, you know, I, I'm, I'm a hugger and I'm a person who puts my heart to their heart. You know, I don't give those cheap hugs. I'm like, I'm gonna give you a hug. Let's touch. Let's do it. So the idea of maybe you don't get to touch very much. So when you touch, make it make it a good one, make it worth it. You know, so being able to pass a lot of information to each other just by touching each other. You know, whether it's like this or heart to heart or head to head or, you know, as our as our family does, you know, in uh, New Zealand to smell each other's breath, to put your your ori to their ori and to be like, you know, to take into each other's breath and how that feels to take in each other's air and to um, to touch the skin. So I'm, I'm just I think right now for today, the answer is around touch and what that landscape might feel like. And, and, and it just begs the question for me, what, what does a landscape look like that is shaped by black culture, by black future, by black understanding um, and black magic versus, you know, what it's shaped by now. It's, uh, it's about, it's about the touch and it's not just the touch from human to human, but the touch of uh, all of the beings in the ecosystem to touch the soil, right? As we say, touch the land, touch the trees, you know, if you are a person who can touch butterflies or bees like I can, then to to be in communion with them and to and to get the transfer, to get the information. So when you walk by, if you live in the Bay Area and you walk by a redwood tree, touch the tree and get that download. Mm. They didn't see it all, all of it, have all the stories. Mm. If you see a rock, touch a rock. If you go in and you see crystals, pick them up. They hold all of the information of the planet. Get your download. So touch. That's mm. where I'm at. Mad Avatar vibes, man. Yes, touch. Yes. I am speechless. I am uh, blown away by the power in this conversation, by the intelligence, the beauty, the grace, the energy, the... I could just go on. There's, there's, there's so many ways to... Adjectives to describe how... Uh, this conversation has uh, awakened something in me. And uh, if we could just, you know, just say one word that we are feeling um, leaving this space together. Uh, let's, let's do that to close. Let's just give a one word, whatever comes to your heart. Abundance. Activated. Connection. Ashe. Ashe, yes. This has been Shaq Conversations, Bay Area Art and Equity, conversation about Afrofuturism. My name is Michelle Antoinette Nelson. I have been honored to be the moderator for this piece. I want to thank Shogun Shido, Ashara Ekundayo, and Awan. Mance for being here. Uh, what a wonderful conversation. This has been brought to you by Jack 15, Oakland Art Murmur, and the Immersive Art Alliance. Thank you all so much for tuning in. See you soon.